We're fortunate to have John Clark. He's a gastroenterologist, professor of medicine at Stanford University. He's a pretty well-known expert in diseases of the esophagus, but he's become interested in amyloid and recently participated in a panel where we're trying to define what are appropriate endpoints. How do we determine that patients with various organs involved with amyloid are actually getting better? What will we measure to say you're better, you're worse, or the same? And he's developed significant expertise in this area, and so Professor Clark, amyloid, and the GI tract. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here. I've been very fortunate to uh, work in the field for about 15 years now. When I was at Hopkins, I um, had the uh, good, good, good fortune to work with uh, Dan Judge, who was here in the crowd. And um, then going towards Stanford, they have a very active group there. Um, it, it also became a little bit uh, personal as well, as my dad was diagnosed as well with wild type. Um, and we, we probably did diagnose him a little bit earlier just because of um, um, these talks and these sessions. So I'm going to um, talk about these questions and try and go through everything in the next 20 minutes. So why does amyloid cause GI symptoms? What symptoms do uh, patients experience? What tests are important and how are they helpful? What treatment options do we have now? What do we know about variants, and when is it good to uh, see someone with NGI? And so if we um, look at the first question, it's interesting that with amyloid, it can really deposit anywhere in the GI tract or else the nerves that control it. And so we see a couple different patterns of involvement um, based on different subtypes. And so the amyloid can go in the inner lining or else the um, what's what's referred to as mucosa. Um, it can deposit within the muscle layers, which are deeper down. It can lie on the nerves, which control the gastrointestinal tract, or it can also affect, affect um, blood vessels going towards that area. And based on where the amyloid deposits often will help help determine what the symptoms are. And so if we look at each of these in turn, with the mucosal, which is the inner layer, if there's um, amyloid involvement in that area, that affects the absorption. And so if there is a loss of absorption, um, at, at that point, diarrhea and weight loss are often the factors that we see. And this is an important area because this is the only area of the four that we, that we can really get to with biopsies from the endoscopy. So oftentimes when we're looking and doing endoscopy and taking biopsies, we can only really determine if there's involvement in this layer. So there may be involvement in the nerves or muscles, et cetera, but we don't pick that up from the endoscopies, unfortunately. In... Uh, um, and in terms of the muscle, the gut, the gut has two different layers of muscle which are present. They're deeper than we get to with um, typical biopsies, but that's the area that really controls the contractile strength. So if there's involvement in that area, what we tend to see are less contractions throughout the gut, and then there's more, more um, sense of stasis in that area, which leads towards higher amounts of gut bacteria and diarrhea. Uh, we can't get to that with the biopsies, but sometimes we can get a sense of involvement from uh, different imaging studies, from motility studies as well. In um, terms of the nerve involvement, it's interesting. We, you know, we think of neuropathy as more what's been talked about beforehand, but the gut actually has about 500, uh, 500 million nerves which are associated with it. And there's thought to be about as many nerves present within the gut as in the spinal cord. So not surprisingly, if amyloid deposits within the nerves, uh, we can see dysmotility and diarrhea with that specifically. Um, now, we don't have a great way of biopsying the GI nerves, nerves uh, specifically, but we can get information based upon a motility testing. And then finally, with the vascular involvement, if there is any involvement within the blood vessels, um, then, then, then a typically in that scenario, we'll, we'll see a bleeding and ulcers. And that's thought to be a little bit less, less common than some of the other pathways that I've talked about. <laughs> 
Now we also can see deposition outside of the the you know the linear gut, looking at the liver, the pancreas, etc. Um, it's not uncommon to see liver involvement. Um, most times the clinical manifestations of that are usually mild, but it can be a marker of distribution that can be um, seen. Now let's um, talk about symptoms. And the symptoms can really link to the area involvement, the pattern of involvement, and they're often nonspecific. And so if there's esophageal involvement, we'll see a reflux and swallowing issues um, most often, occasionally food impaction. In on the stomach, more abdominal pain uh, plus distension. Small bowel is often diarrhea, weight loss. And then a colon, we can see both um, diarrhea and constipation. But the, the big caveat with this is that it's important to remember that most of these symptoms are nonspecific. And so there's often not a symptom that you can look at and say, this is definitely from the amyloid. And most of these symptoms that I talk about are pretty common within the population. And so reflux is seen about 20% of, of, of U.S. adults at least once a week, 50% at least once a year. Uh, swallowing issues are seen about 4% of American adults. Um, discomfort or early satiety can be seen in as many as 30 per percent, constipation about 15 percent, and and typically diarrhea about six. So it's hard to know a lot of times when these symptoms are present, is this related to amyloid or, or not? Uh, second thing is that just because someone has amyloid doesn't mean they can't have something else as well. And so it's important to make sure that we're not just saying this is amyloid and not looking for cancers and celiac disease and other things along those lines. And then the third point of note is that the most common adverse effects with most medications which are used tend to be GI symptoms. And so it's often very hard to separate what's a symptom from amyloid and what's a result of the medications. And that can be very challenging to sort out. To make it more confusing, about 80% of people that take five or more meds will have at least one adverse effect from one of those five that may not be seen. And so again, it's very tough to separate is, is this a GI result of amyloid or is this a result of you know, life in general, age, and other medications? Now, let's uh, talk about the tests that we have and how they're helpful. And we'll typically do endoscopy and colonoscopy to look and see if there's any involvement within the mucosa. Um, this allows us to look directly, take biopsies. There are stains that we can do and look at amyloid specifically with that. If we do see any sign of narrowing or stiffening, we can stretch in that area. If there's bleeding, we can treat that. Um, the findings are often nonspecific, um, but this is helpful for looking to see if there is involvement within that, that, you know, that, that uh, first layer that's there. Oftentimes, um, we'll uh, look at just just the rectum because it's the easiest to get to. Um, but if you look at uh, biopsy yield throughout the GI tract, duodenum is probably the highest yield. Um, now, there are a number of other tests which are out there, and this was me uh, getting manometry and reflux testing back in 2006. And so we have a number of imaging tests, motility studies, breath tests that will essentially look at the contractions throughout the gut um, we'll, we'll um, look at the stiffness of uh, the gut, and then uh, the breath test can look at small intestinal bacteria. Um, the challenge with all of these is that they are all nonspecific, so there's not really a pattern that you'll see where you can say, yes, this is amyloid, um, but it, it, it may um, give information that you could use to help guide uh, what to do as next steps in terms of therapy. Um, what about treatment? And you know, treatment should really be tailored towards symptoms and GI involvement. But because of how common these symptoms are just in the population in general, it's really very fair to start with treatment first before doing a lot of these testing. And when we look at the treatments that are available, you know, it's important to say that diet and lifestyle is often the first step before doing medications. The treatment really va varies based on the area. And so with the esophagus, we'll often look at um, dietary change. If, if a reflux is a big factor, um, antacids, histamine receptor blockers, and proton pump 
um, tend to be the, the mainstay of therapy. Um, in carefully selected patients, there are procedures as well that we can do to try and tighten the sphincter valve that separates the esophagus and stomach, but we, we try to be very um, careful in selecting. In terms of swallowing issues, so, uh, again, dietary approaches are often the first line attempt, but that's a situation where if there is any narrowing, dilation with a balloon or at times Botox can, can uh, be of help in that scenario. In terms of the stomach, a lot of the times we're trying to change the diet to let the stomach have less less distension and empty faster. And so a low particle diet, smaller meals, uh, uh, low fat. But if that's not successful, then we have a number of different meds which are out there. And so they fall into a couple different categories. We have prokinetics, which are medications that increase the motility of the gut. There's also medications that improve the expansion of the gut. And then we'll use some of the same meds that were talked about in the last session to try and decrease the sensitivity of the GI nerves. Um, and oftentimes with a combo of those three or one of those three, we can um, tend to get symptoms better. Um, and then there, there is some literature that if uh, part of the symptoms may be secondary to stiffening of the lower stomach, that in uh, that situation, um, bow, Botox in the lower stomach may help. In terms of the small bowel, uh, uh, some of the options are similar, but um, you know, typically in the small bowel, we'll focus on two things. We'll either try to decrease the bacteria within the gut, and the um, background of this is that everybody has about three pounds of gut bacteria which are present, and we don't have a, a, a great um, sense right now as to what's normal and what's not, but there is a thought that if there's any dysmotility in the small bowel that's present, that the type of bacteria and the amount of bacteria um, will go up in volume. And if there's higher amounts of bacteria in the small bowel, that um, tends to uh, decrease the absorption because the bacteria will process the food first, and, uh, and uh, typically the main symptom with that is diarrhea. And so oftentimes with small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, we'll use some of the same prokinetics to increase the contractions, but we'll also look at antibiotics as well with the idea of decreasing the bacteria and increasing the absorption. Um, as well, if, um, you know, if the main symptom is diarrhea and we think some of that is from decreased absorption with amyloid, then oftentimes just giving medications to slow down the motility can help significantly. And so that's a situation though that we'll look at things like Imodium, Lamodal, um, you know, and, and this is one of the situations where I, I use tincture of opium in my own practice. Um, this is essentially all of the, you know, what's thought to be the, the negative GI effects of opium distilled within a liquid without the, the um, sort of addictive component, euphoria, and things along those lines. But it's, it's kind of like a modium that's supercharged. And so if diarrhea is a, a, a big factor and you've tried everything else and it's not working, this is something that's out there. Um, given the um, insurance restrictions and, and, and uh, government restrictions now, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge at times to write for, but, but, but most times we end up getting it passed. Um, in rare cases, we'll look at nutrition with the IV, but we you know, really try and do everything that we can not to. And then finally, with the colon, if uh, constipation is a big issue, we've got a number of medications which are out there. There's now five medications that are FDA approved specifically for constipation. There's also a new um, capsule that um, that's actually a mechanical capsule that vibrates, which was recently approved as well. And the idea with that is that it just kind of shakes through and gets things going. And um, it's new enough that we're figuring out where it works, but it's got the appeal of at least, you know, not interfering with the other medications which are out there. Um, so what do we know about the variants? And it's, it's interesting. If you look at um, studies that have looked at a mucosal deposition with amyloid in uh, different populations, I've been very surprised by how low the involvement is reported to be. And so in these three studies specifically where they've looked at the yield with biopsies, they've quoted uh, prevalence of anywhere from three to uh, 15%, um, which is much lower than I, I would think. Now, I, I think the caveats to that are that oftentimes they're looking at populations and it's a subset of those who um, get endoscopies and biopsies. So it may be a little bit higher, but I think the take home point is that 
oftentimes the um, GI involvement is neuropathic and, and not necessarily GI deposition within the, the um, baseline layers. Um, but the take-home point is that it's not uncommon for people to have amyloid that's established and for us to look with endoscopy and colonoscopy and not find it with biopsies. That doesn't mean, unfortunately, it's not there. Um, in terms of looking at the variant specifically, the um, Theos um, um, uh, site had, had done questionnaires and looked at symptoms with different variants. And what they reported was that with a lot of the familial variants, particularly the neuropathic ones, that the GI uh, symptoms in that context are probably about 60% approximately. Um, but interestingly, if you look at the um, cardiac variant specifically without a, a lot of nerve involvement, um, in their series, the uh, GI involvement for that and wild type was in the 15 to 20% range. And they actually went so far as to say that for that subset of amyloid that they didn't feel the prevalence of GI conditions was higher than the general population. Um, if you look at that, 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 that same group and then follow them a long time, they, they did see though that the longer people have a diagnosis of amyloid and symptoms of amyloid, the more symptoms there, there were. And that kind of reinforces what we see clinically in, in that if you do have a diagnosis that you know treatment earlier is probably a benefit. Um, this looks through some of the, the different um, groups specifically in the mutations. The key thing is that the neuropathic variants are you know seem to have much higher GI rates than the cardiac variants. And then what do we know about change with treatment? And you know, this is still a little bit unclear. I think we're going to know a lot more about this in the next couple of years, but at least looking at the Apollo trial, um, it does look like that when people are followed long term that um, there, there may be a trend towards improvement in GI symptoms. Um, more patients had either improvement in diarrhea or no change in diarrhea when on the med versus a, a sense of things being, being worse. And if you looked at uh, body mass as well, across the board, it was about the same, same throughout the trial uh, versus the group that got placebo where weight dropped. But about 42% of the people actually had, had a, a slight in, in increase in body weight. So my sense, at least clinically, and it, it, it may be somewhat biased with optimism, but I feel like uh, people that I'm seeing who are on therapy, who I'm, feeling, who, who I'm seeing long term, I feel like I'm seeing a slow improvement in GI symptoms. Um, and then finally, when to um, see a gastroenterologist. And you know, the, the, the big things that I, I think it would make sense is if there are symptoms that are not responding towards diet and supplements, um, if there's a question of weight loss or decreased nutrition, if there's anything that's unusual with, with the presentation where it just doesn't seem to fit, um, or if there's a need to do any testing specifically. And, you know, we, we will um, often do endoscopy and colonoscopy to look and see if there's tissue deposition, but I, I, I do often think that if we know there's tissue deposition elsewhere, I'm sometimes not sure what the addition of the GI biopsies necessarily add in that scenario. But if, GI de if, if you know, tissue deposition is not established elsewhere and there's GI symptoms, then I, I, I do think looking and taking biopsies can, can, can help in that situation. Um, we, we don't want to just assume everything is amyloid, and so if there are tests which are necessary to make sure we're not missing celiac disease, inflammatory bowel, other things along those, those lines, um, or if there's complications that we, we, we can treat in that scenario. And, and so in conclusion, um, we can see GI symptoms with either direct deposition or nerve involvement. Um, only the very inner layer can, uh, can uh, be assessed with endoscopy and biopsies. So if the biopsies are negative, it doesn't exclude amyloid deposition elsewhere in the GI tract. Um, we do see involvement commonly with um, neuropathic variants, less so with, with um, cardiac and wild type. Um, we do have uh, testing options, and we do have a number of therapies which are out. Most of the therapies we have are not specific with amyloid, but more, more based on symptom relief. Um, but there is some optimism that these newer, um, uh, more, you know, more um, therapy-derived 
uh, treatments which which are coming out to treat amyloid will have a, a long-term benefit in terms of GI symptoms. And you know we should see in the next couple of years with that. So thank you.